I want to tell you a story because that's what I do best. I'm a songwriter and a storyteller. I had a brief stint in seminary about 10 years ago, but it didn't stick. Um, it was clear to me that I had a very particular calling in the world, and that was to make music and to engage in the idea of ministry in the world, but not through the lens of a particular theology, through the lens of humanism, through the lens of the idea that all human beings are equal, that all human beings are of value. And as much as I hold extraordinary affinity for many theological ideas that I call my own, as an ambassador of goodwill, as an ambassador of human rights through music, um, I have the privilege of visiting many traditions, and it is such a privilege to be here today at the epicenter of the unity movement. What a, what a tremendous campus you have here, and what an extraordinary community. Thank you. I want to talk about the idea of civil disobedience, an idea that was first, to my knowledge, put in print by Henry David Thoreau, one of the great thinkers about transcendentalism, was also a very staunch pragmatist about issues of social justice. With his friend Ralph Waldo Emerson, they had many extraordinary debates about many issues. and. Um, uh, in 1849, Henry David Thoreau wrote a piece called Civil Disobedience, talking about our moral obligation to stand in opposition to institutions that have become immoral. Uh, one of his interpretations of that in his time and place, while the United States had just finished a war of aggression against Mexico, when an Irish regiment that became known in Mexico as the San Patricios, the St. Patrick's Brigade, uh, defected from the U.S. Army and went to fight on behalf of the Mexicans because what they saw was an imperial force heading into a Catholic nation, and they were Catholics, and there were Catholics from England and Germany and from Canada and France that also joined the San Patricios, and they stood up against this war of aggression that the United States was pushing on its southern neighbor to claim territory. They had lived in a nation that had experienced oppression, that had experienced this, and they identified very deeply with a message in Christian scripture and the Gospels about standing up for what they believed, and so they were called traitors by the Americans, by the U.S. Army and government. They were called heroes by the Mexicans whose villages were being overrun. And um, that had just happened. Slavery was not yet ended. Women did not have the vote. And Thoreau decided he was not going to pay his taxes in protest, that it was a moral imperative for him not to financially support the oppression of other people by his own government. And so he went to jail. And Ralph Waldo Emerson went down to pay his bail because Thoreau had not brought any money with him. And <clears throat> Thoreau says, well, you know, what'd you come down here for? And Emerson says, I, I came down here to pay your bail. And what are you doing in jail anyways? You have money, just pay your taxes. What's the matter with you? And he says, why aren't you in here with me? Why are you trying to get me out rather than joining me in a position of solidarity with the oppressed? Thus began a deep and lengthy dialogue between these two men who had been friends for years, but it was a new chapter in their conversation. The idea of civil disobedience traveled across the ocean, and Leo Tolstoy, uh, War and Peace, Anna Karenina, many famous works, um, he decided to write about it as well. Give me just a second here. This is a wonderful line from Thoreau before I move on to Tolstoy. Quote, as a man cannot lift a mountain, and as a kindly man cannot kill an infant, so a man living the Christian life cannot take part in deeds of violence. Of what value then to him are arguments about the imaginary advantages of doing what is morally impossible for him to do anyway? A lot, I mean, it's, it's slightly flowery language for our modern context. It sounds a little anachronistic to us, 
But the idea is, why try and convince someone to do something that is against their moral center anyways? You're going to create conflict in that person, and you're likely not going to convince them to do something that's against their value system. Tolstoy picks up this idea and writes about it extensively. Um, I'm just coming into a deeper appreciation for the writing of Tolstoy. I have to admit, the first time I tried to read War and Peace, I was intimidated and didn't get very far through it. But I've found some, some smaller works by Tolstoy that have allowed me to enter his thinking. I sit on a man's back, choking him and making him carry me and yet assure myself and others that I am very sorry for him and wish to ease his lot by all possible means, except by getting off his back. <laughs> Tolstoy has some uncomfortable things to say about privilege and about power and about what it is that we do with our life and our choices. After having read that, I left a larger tip for the cleaning staff that were in my hotel at the conference. A small action, a small action connected to a thought and carried forward in the world. You might say, what's the difference between 10 or $20 as a tip for someone? For some people, that is an extraordinary difference in their life. For some people, $10 is a conceivable sum of money. It is purchasing power that they don't have. It's a small action, a small sacrifice for those that have $10, but a huge difference in the life of those that don't. Mohandas Gandhi, the Mahatma, picked up on this idea of civil disobedience from Thoreau and then through Tolstoy, and he started thinking, how could he make a difference in the society in which he lived? An educated man, a man of the upper middle class, his family had the money in a country that was impoverished to send him to Oxford in England to study law. He did not culturally have a problem with the idea of there being class boundaries or racial boundaries. This was a country that had an idea of untouchability and nearly half the population of the subcontinent were of the caste that were considered untouchable. Now they refer to themselves as Dalits. But Gandhi really didn't seem to have a problem with there being racial or uh, class distinctions, but he felt like he should be on the upper side of things. If there were a division between people of color and white, he should be on the white side. Between the lowest caste and the upper class, he should be in the upper class. And his time in England reinforced some of these ideas for him. And then he went to South Africa because he couldn't get a job as a lawyer in India. So he was hired by a trading company in South Africa. And for the first time in his life, his family's privilege in India was meaningless. And he was facing racism for the first time in his life as being the recipient of racism. And his ideas changed very vividly. And I love that he was a different man at 50 than he had been at 35. And by the time he went back to India in his late 40s, mid 40s, um, to really begin in earnest the work of Satyagraha, the work of transformation, the work of civil disobedience in India. He had become a totally different human being in his perspective on these things. And we have to be willing to give each other space to evolve and grow if we want our society to evolve and grow. We can't come back and say, well, last week you said blah, 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 blah. You know, we have to, we have to give each other that freedom to learn new things and become more than we have been. A friend of mine greeted me at the conference, and I, I know that I'm treading on very thin ice here, but it's an amusing anecdote to me. He came up to me, he's a very conservative man from Texas, staunch libertarian, and without there being any viable libertarian candidates, he votes for Republicans most of the time. He came up to me and he shook my hand and he said, well, Joe, I must concede that you were correct last year. There are things to be concerned about. <laughs> Can you imagine what a step that was from where he was a year ago to meet me over here? on the left side of the stage <laughs> and say, there might be some things to be concerned about. Extraordinary ideas. Let me read the quote first, then we'll get back to it. This is from Gandhi. An unjust law is itself a species of violence. Arrest for its breach is more so. 
Now the law of nonviolence says that violence should be resisted not by counterviolence, but by nonviolence. This I do by breaking the law and by peacefully submitting to arrest and imprisonment. Civil disobedience carried forward. Gandhi and many of his community walked into a protest. Um, they, well, they were protesting themselves, but there was a counter sort of demonstration by the, the, the police of the Raj, the British government in India. And they wanted to walk through to a particular place, and the police had all lined up the constables with their nightsticks. And Gandhi walked in to the line of police and was beaten. And hundreds of people walked into the line of police without raising a hand and submitted to being bludgeoned in order to demonstrate to the English people the brutality that was going on in India. At the time, the British people, the British Empire, thought of themselves as the height of civilization, as the most civilized people that had ever lived. And Gandhi felt like if he could get past the British government and get into the hearts of the English people with an understanding that their oppression of the subcontinent of India, that their occupation was immoral and made them less than the most civilized people on earth, that the British people would not stand for it. And he was right. It took 40 years, but he was right. Those walls came down. In 1930, Gandhi began the campaign that really, in my mind, was the end of the Raj, was the end of the occupation. And then World War II happened, and then it took until after the war to finally give India full independence. But he had a simple idea. Let's make evaporative sea salt. There's a law against making salt because the Brits wanted the Indians to buy salt from them that had been mined. Salt was everything to a laborer. Salt was life. A middle-class person could pay a tax on salt, then it was an inconvenience. An owning-class person could pay a tax on salt, and it was irrelevant. But a Dalit, one of the untouchable caste that was doing all of the heavy lifting, the physical labor, for them the salt tax constituted a significant portion of their income, and they, they literally would die without salt, sweating it in the subcontinental heat. And Gandhi said, what if we just march to the sea in defiance of this law and gather seawater and let it evaporate and collect the salt? Nobody had to pay anything. It's free. The ocean is right there. What Gandhi had figured out is that the salt tax was 9% of the gross revenue of the Raj in India. 9%. It took the government of the Raj six weeks to even arrest Gandhi. This movement had spread all over the, the subcontinent. They were like, oh, our, our mystic is up to it again. <laughs> but he found their Achilles heel with the salt tax. And what he did more than that is he found a way to franchise the Dalits that had previously been understood as untouchable. He found a way to franchise them into the movement because they had been of a mind that, you know, as Pete Townsend wrote for The Who, new boss, same as the old boss. You know, what does it matter if we have a, you know, <laughs> if we have someone here in India that is making our life miserable or if we have somebody in England making our life miserable? It's all the same for us. And Gandhi extended a hand and said, no, you are part of this movement. You are part of what we are doing. Justice includes you. Dorothy Day of the Catholic Worker Movement picked up on this idea during the Depression and moving forward in the United States, picked up on the idea that we have an obligation to each other. She started hospitality houses across the United States so that people who were struggling, who were out of work, could go have a place to get cleaned up, get a meal, borrow a suit if they needed to, go get a job interview, set up an independent savings plan so that the money they earned didn't just ride around in their pockets. They could begin to live collectively in a way to help each other. But she wrote, interestingly, on a spiritual side, the greatest challenge of the day is how to bring about a revolution of the heart a revolution that has to start 
with each one of us. That led into organizing in the labor movement, the CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations. They were taking organizing models that had been learned from the women's suffrage movement. 1919 would be the 100th anniversary of when Congress passed the 19th Amendment. It went out to all the states, came back ratified in 1920, and women had the vote in the United States. There was so much organizing that had been done from that, they decided to begin to organize the working class in this country in a different way, not just by trade, but that every worker had a right to justice in the workplace. So the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the CIO, was born in order to bring that voice to people, whether they were pushing a broom or building a wall or taking one down. Baird Rustin witnessed this growing up. What he saw was the fact, the Rosie the Riveters, you remember seeing those posters of Rosie with her bandana and rolling up her sleeve from World War II? At the same time, people of color were experiencing advancement in this country in ways that they never had. Because so many of the white workers went off to war and they needed workers and people of color ended up in the, the, the factories, the assembly plants that created ships, the shipyards, the, the airplane factories. The problem is they were paying women and people of color a fraction of what they had been paying white men to do the same job. And the Congress of Industrial Organizations started talking to congressmen and to senators and saying, hey, this is war profiteering, this is immoral. Now we're back to Thoreau and standing up against a system that has become immoral. And they said, either you need to pay these workers the same that the white workers were making, or you need to pay the contractors less because they're paying out less and profiting by the difference off of the backs of other people. Baird Rustin, one of the great leaders of the civil rights movement of the 1950s, was also homosexual. And he was shuffled off to Buffalo when the whole movement really took off because they didn't know how to deal with the fact that he was gay. Such a simple thing in our modern context now. I don't mean to say simple for those that have lived a life of oppression as a result of their identity. But if you look at how far we have traveled from the early 50s to right now, where marriage equality is the law of the land, it is a simpler thing now to come out of the closet than it was for Baird. And yet, he did, and he experienced oppression for it. And someone asked him, why are you public about this? And he said simply, you cannot make your life a bridge and not expect to get walked on. Talk about extraordinary spiritual vision. Talk about pairing an idea of progress with a spiritual center that is so rock solid that it cannot be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved. You know this one. We shall not, we shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the water. We shall not be moved. One of the great, great spiritual songs, one of the great songs of the civil rights and social justice movements. Our faith our faith becomes the water. And when we plant ourselves by the water, when we drink of that ever-renewing wellspring of forgiveness, of love, of community, of engagement, we're like that tree. Rosa Parks didn't just happen to get up one day on a bus and decide that she was going to take action. She trained herself in nonviolent resistance. She went to a place called the Highlander Center in Tennessee. She was chosen, she was interviewed, she was selected from a whole set of activists at the time as being the person who had the emotional and the mental stability, the spiritual foundation, and the conviction and the amiability to take large public action and hold her center. She was trained in how to do this in a way that would not create further conflict, how to resist her human instinct to fight back physically when she was hit, when she was hurt. She was trained in a spiritual practice that allowed her to resist that most basic instinct to fight back in the moment and how to sit inside her spiritual center. And at a moment of her choosing, having all of this training and having been trained by the movement, she chose a particular moment and said, 
this is the moment. And she refused to sit in the back of the bus. She refused to go back there. It was her faith. Yeah. It was the faith of Rosa Parks in her creator, in an idea that Theodore Parker, a Unitarian minister, quoted by King, saying that the moral arc of the universe is long, but it leans toward justice, it bends toward justice. She believed in that. She believed in a just creator, and she also believed that she needed to meet her creator in partnership, in engaging in direct action to make the world a more just place, a place with equal access for all people. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King says, an individual who breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust and who willingly accepts the penalty of imprisonment in order to arouse the conscience of the community over its injustice is in reality expressing the highest respect for the law. He was saying it's not just being a rabble rouser. It's not just being difficult. Difficult. It's a moral obligation. The Buddha said the greatest way to end our own suffering is to be of service to other people. There's an extraordinary correlation between the suffering we experience and not being engaged. And as soon as we engage, our own suffering becomes less consequential. Jesus spoke of these things deeply. You have all read the Gospels. We all have our own understanding of them. And whether you consider yourself a metaphysical Christian or a metaphorical Christian or a seeker of truth from all traditions, we have read these words and we each have some idea of what they mean to us. But the way I read them, there's a call to action in the Scriptures. There's a call to action. And that call is to engage. Yes, we are responsible for our spiritual center. Like Rosa Parks, we have to hold on to our faith. And I'm not asking all of you to go out and get arrested. To be clear, <laughs> I've cited some pretty extraordinary examples of commitment to justice here. What I am asking you to do, what I am asking you to do, is to think of one thing in your life one place where you can take a specific action and to do it. If all of us do something, it makes a difference. We don't all have to do everything. We don't all have to be up on every issue. It would be impossible. We would drive ourselves crazy and do nothing at all except stay on the internet and read things, which we have all determined is not healthy for us. Not a good choice. Doesn't help us live an emergent life. I've started carrying $5 bills in my pocket. When the guy takes my luggage at the airport, I give him a five. When the guy that drives me to the airport from my car, the little shuttle bus, I give him a five. You know, it's a pretty good sized tip for a small act, but it's also a statement. It's a statement that says, I value your work and I value you as a person. I see the human being behind the young man of color who is carrying my bag. So I want you to think about one thing in your life that you can do out of your spiritual center, out of your groundedness, that brings the idea of civil disobedience, of nonviolent resistance, of loving engagement forward in your lives and in your community. My grandmother was what many people would call an illegal alien. That word just makes me cringe. I hope someday that word is up there with other racial epithets that we have just eradicated from common use. She was an undocumented immigrant at the age of three. She was one of the original dreamers, as they call them. In 1903, she came down with her family from Quebec, from up in, from up in Canada. The whole family, a whole generation was leaving what was a fairly a 
repressive government at the time to the Francophones, the French speakers, and they settled in central Minnesota, no questions asked. I'm guessing in 1903 the prevailing attitude was if you were willing to settle in central Minnesota, you were welcome to it, but... In 1914, my granddad Felix Kilbride came over on a steamship from Ireland. He came through Ellis Island, a very different experience. And I think about them. And I think about all of those today who are fleeing war and hunger and privation of one form or another in search of a better life. And they come here because they believe that it's better here. It's up to us to make sure that it is better here. From far away and distant land the tempest tossed with hopeful hearts and calloused hands Reach toward the light, the torch held high And cast their gaze upon the lady of the harbor And she welcomes them with open arms She says, let my children hear Shine on, shine on, oh, you lady of the harbor. And so it was with my own kin. They sailed from Sweden and from France and Ireland And their earthly cares packed in their bags They cast their gaze upon the lady of the harbor And she welcomed them with open arms She said, let my children hear Shine on, shine on, shine on, oh, you lady of the harbor. Now we're locking down the borders and we're filling up the jails, and we say they don't belong. How conveniently. Forget that we've all come to sing the same sweet song. Will the dream survive the strain? Will huddled masses have a chance to learn its sweet refrain? Or will we fall into our fears? And and turn our backs against the lady of the harbor And she welcomes them with open arms She says, let my children in Shine on, shine on, shine on Oh, you lady of the harbor Shine on, shine on, shine on, oh, you lady of the harbor. Shine on, shine on, oh, you lady of the harbor. Oh, you lady of the heart.